Thank you, Kathy, and um, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. And I apologize. I got on the plane in San Francisco yesterday evening, and I was feeling fine. And now I've got a really bad, walked off with a really bad cold. So I don't know what's happening. But um, anyway, so um, the work I'm going to be presenting today is a little bit different than what you've been hearing. Um, and we've been working on dysregulated pH and diseases for a number of years, mostly focusing on cancer, and only recently with some funding from the Paul, Paul Allen Family Foundation have we started exploring um, some links between intracellular pH dynamics and neurodegeneration. So for many years, probably my entire career, we've been interested in a very fundamental question. And that is, how do proton fluxes across biological membranes, plasma membrane, organelle membranes, regulate cell behaviors? And essentially, some of those cell behaviors are shown here. And essentially, that can be whittled down to how are cell behaviors regulated by pH dynamics? whether it be lysosomal, mitochondrial, cytosolic, pH dynamics. It's a relatively understudied question, uh, but it is phenomenally fundamental to um, cell biology. So with regard to today's, the topic of today's symposium, there is a reversed cytosolic and lysosomal pH when comparing cancer versus neurodegeneration. So as you've heard, uh, you know, you've heard the term homeostasis over and over again. So intracellular pH is very tightly maintained through a number of homeostatic mechanisms, mostly plasma membrane ion transport proteins that transport either protons or, or bicarbonate. And uh, whoops, are um, maintained to be uh, to maintain pH relatively neutral, and I can't figure out how that's not working. Um, relatively neutral, however, this is increased and dysregulated in cancer. Why isn't the green working? And, um, and it's lower cytosolic in neurodegeneration. In contrast, lysosomal pH has actually the opposite. So in cancers, lysosomal pH, which is normally about um, 4.5, it's exceptionally low. Lysosomal pH, is it working for you? <laughs> is, is very low. In cancers, it's even lower. In neurodegeneration, it's much higher. Is that working? Thank you. Uh, no, it's not. Um, maybe all the way up to, oh, that'd be one, well. I have to double fist it? Red, oh, there it is. Can you see that? Um, relatively higher. Okay, so we're actually beginning to think more and more about neurodegeneration and dysregulated lysosomal pH. Okay, so lysosomal pH is maintained very low to maintain activity of acid-activated proteases. There's about 60 proteases in the lumen of the lysosome, cathepsins of all different classes. And when the lysosomal pH is increased, then these, the activity of these cathepsins is markedly decreased Protein degradation is markedly decreased, and that's what we believe is a major contributor to, <laughs> to, um, to neurodegeneration. There we go. Okay, so this is fine. We can talk about pH dynamics, but what we're really interested in is really digging deeply and understanding at the molecular level what this means. And that's what I was trying to convey by my talk, the title of my talk, on how proteins respond. Because although these diseases, cancer and neurodegeneration, are sort of at opposite spectrums with regard to reversed pH dynamics, we think that 
a lot of the principles we've determined in cancer, dysregulated pH, are going to apply to dysregulated pH and neurogeneration, specific, specifically in terms of protein electrostatics and how it changes protein electrostatics. So we're really interested in trying to understand the design principles and functions of what we call pH sensors. Now, all proteins are pH sensitive, but we're talking about select proteins that have activities or ligand binding activities or stability in a very narrow physiological range, maybe going down to 6.8 for cytosolic in neurodegeneration and going all the way up to 7, 6, 7, 7 in cancers. And inherent or fundamental to how we describe pH sensors is our belief of considering protonation as a post-translational modification. Very similar to phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, but in contrast to these other post-translational modifications, protonation, deprotonation, is very difficult to study and determine. It can't, be, it can't be measured by mass spectrometry. You can't pick it up with an antibody, and it's not catalyzed by an enzyme. So it's very much, much more difficult to study than other forms of, of uh, post-translational modification. But there is specificity, and that specificity is mediated by residues, amino acid residues, that are titratable within whatever pH range you're working with. Now, normally, this is predominantly histidines because they're the only amino acid that has, in solution at least, a pKa near neutral. However, what we've learned is through cooperativity and different protein landscapes that, that amino acids, especially glutamic acid, possibly buried lysines, have, can have markedly upshifted or downshifted pKa's depending on the protein landscape and cooperativity. So I'm going to talk sort of, my talk's going to talk about two different areas. First, cancer, pH, dysregulated pH, and then a little bit on neurodegeneration. We have much less on neurodegeneration. It's a completely new direction for my lab. It only started because of the Allen fa uh, funding just a little over a year ago. Um, so we'll, we'll spend more time talking about cancer. And we've been showing how this increase in intracellular pH enables cancer progression and behaviors through multiple mechanisms and by multiple pH sensors. So four of the mechanisms that we've predominantly focused on are uh, metastasis and cell migration. And that's actually part of how I met Jonathan Cooper sitting up there. Metabolic reprogramming, which you've heard about, and I'm not actually going to talk about, but a number of glycolytic enzymes, most notably phosphofructokinase, which is the gatekeeper of glycolysis, is exquisitely pH sensitive. It's been known for over 50 years, but we don't know the molecular mechanism, so that's something we're working on. So its activity can increase as much as 50-fold between, say, pH 7 and 7.4. Um, but I am going to tell you two short stories, current stories, on pH and dysplasia, as well as pH and somatic mutations. And this latter one, I think, can be very relevant to um, neurodegeneration, and I'll, I'll try to explain the, 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 the link, uh, at least in my thinking. So we've done most work on metastasis and cell migration. And just as an example, we've gone in, we've used biochemistry, cell biology, molecular dynamics. These are all through collaborations. NMR to figure out actual pKa's. And we've identified at least five or six different pH sensors. One, for example, is cofilin, uh, which is required for pH-dependent actin assemblies. And what's interesting is the, of the many pH sensors we've identified, they have different modes of regulation. So cofilin is what we call a coincidence detector. It requires two hits to be active. So it requires dephosphorylation of an N-terminal serine residue, and it requires dephosphorylation 
of a histidine residue. And this regulates an electrostatic interaction with PIP2 in the membrane, plasma membrane. We've also identified pH sensors involved in pH-dependent focal adhesion remodeling. One is Talon uh, that has pH-dependent actin binding. Talon is a focal adhesion protein. And Talon is what we call an allosterically regulate, or it, uh, pH allosterically regulates it. Because there's a pH sensor region in one part of the molecule which is remote from the actin binding site. And it's also what we call cooperativity because a number of these other residues have a markedly upshifted pKa, and we've determined this by NMR. And then finally, there's focal adhesion kinase, or FAC, which we recently showed is also a pH sensor, and this has to do with conformational changes within two domains of the protein that allow autophosphorylation of a critical tyrosine residue. So I want to tell two very quick, brief stories, and they, they sort of convey to you how we approach this problem. And they're related to cancer, and they're, they can be sort of carried over to how we're studying neurodegeneration. And the first is on dysplasia, and the second is on somatic mutations. So a few years ago, um, so it had been known that, that oncogenes increase pH. So RAS makes pH go, RAS V12, say, makes pH, intracellular pH go through the roof, very, very high. So we wanted to actually show this in um, live animals. So we generated Drosophila models expressing a pH biosensor, genetically encoded. This is called Florin, which is a variant of GFP. So GFP is pH sensitive, but the pKa is about four and a half. And so Florin now has a couple of mutations and a pKa of seven. So it's got the right pKa for measuring cytosolic pH. And then we fuse it, whoops. We fuse it to M. cherry, which has a pKa of four, and isn't, the fluorescence isn't going to change in the cytosol. And so that now is normalized. The fluorine signal is normalized to M-cherry to tell us how much probe is there or expressed. OK, and so as proof of principle, we expressed in the eye, Drosophila eye epithelium oncogenic RAF, which is just downstream of RAS. We get a dysplasia. And by ratiometric imaging, a much higher pH than normal cells. So then we asked, what if we just increase pH in the absence of an oncogene? And lo and behold, we also get dysplasia. It's not quite as severe as RAF, but we do get dysplasia and a higher pH. And we did this by overexpressing a sodium proton exchanger, which is a proton efflux transporter. And we know it's pH dependent because if we express a mutant transporter that lacks proton efflux, we have no effect on the I phenotype. So this is interesting, but most importantly, because of the beauty of fly genetics, Drosophila genetics, we can now start using modifier screens to see what's causing this. And that's what Brie Grillo Hill did in our lab. So here's the rough eye phenotype with the overexpression and dysplasia. And we did a targeted screen with signaling molecules. And lo and behold, what we came up with was uh, the strongest hit was armadillo, which is mammalian beta catenin. So when we overexpress armadillo or beta catenin, we nearly completely suppress the phenotype. And if we knock it down, we enhance the phenotype. OK, so this suggested that perhaps this dysplasia might be due to the fact that beta catenin um, expression is markedly down or decreased. And we went on to confirm that in both flies and mammalian cells that if we increase pH, we get less beta catenin expression. And we then went on, and I'm just summarizing um, um, a number, uh, quite a bit of data, we went on to show that this is a stability effect. 
that at lower pH, the half-life of beta-catenin is about threefold less or shorter than that of at, at uh, a normal pH, 7.4 versus 7.7. 7. Okay, so most of you know that beta-catenin is, has, wears multiple hats. It's a cell-cell adhesion protein as part of the e cadherin complex, and it's also a signaling protein downstream of Wnt, multiple Wnt um, ligands. Okay, so how does it function in both? It's stability or it's, um, yeah, its stability and its degradation is markedly regulated. So to be degraded, what happens is GSK3 beta, which is a kinase, phosphorylates serine residues and also a threonine residue in the amino terminus of beta-catenin. And what Wnt signaling does is it inhibits GSK3 beta. So when these serines are phosphorylated, the E3 ligase, beta tercep, docks, binds, ubiquitinates the N-terminus, or, or beta-catenin, and sends it to the proteasome for degradation. All right? So the first thing we thought, logically, you might also, is that um, somehow pH is regulating GSK3 beta activity. It doesn't. And then we noticed and for some reason, it has really not been uh, reported in the literature, that there is a histidine just in the middle of this consensus sequence that's recognized by beta tercep. So we thought, well, maybe for some way that this protonation of the histidine at lower pH might prevent phosphorylation, and that would make it more stable. That's not what we saw either. We showed this in vitro and in cells. It has no effect on the phosphorylation. But what it does is it affects binding by beta tercep. Now one thing that's limiting us is that the, we've looked, done a lot of molecular dynamics with protein conformations and protein structure, but the end terminus of beta catenin is unstructured. So we're sort of limited in terms of being able to model this. So what we did see, though, however, um, is that a paper from a number of years ago of the crystal structure of beta tercep was made with the docking of a beta-catenin peptide, just an N-terminal peptide. And although it wasn't mentioned in this paper, one thing that caught our eye, because we're always looking at histidines, is that a histidine residue, this histidine 36 in beta-catenin, is very close proximity to a lysine in the E3 ligase. With the prediction that when that histidine is protonated at a lower pH, you're going to get electrostatic repulsion. And it needs to be deprotonated with a higher pH for possibly to get binding. And we went on and showed this, both in vitro with recombinant proteins, that there is more binding of beta tenin and beta tercep at a higher pH compared to a lower pH. But this binding does require phosphorylation, as shown here in um, these two, the cyan and the green. So you still need phosphorylation, but that protonation state of that histidine is very, very important in conferring binding, so that it needs to be deprotonated. And we could show this also in cells by doing co-immunoprecipitations. We immunoprecipitated beta-catenin in cells in which we could manipulate either low or high pH. And at higher pH, more beta uh, tercep co-precipitates. And we say even more if we stabilize by using a proteasome inhibitor. Now, I don't have the data, it just came off the rack last week, but now we've looked at um, a lysine mutant for this, and we still get binding if we mutate that histidine to a lysine, but binding's markedly reduced, and there is no pH sensitivity. So it really current, sort of hones in on the prediction that beta-catenin, like cofillin, might be a coincidence detector, requiring both phosphorylation, whoops, of the serines as well as uh, deprotonation of the histidines. So to further confirm that and go back to the biology, 
What we found is in the cosmic database of cancer mutations, it's not very recurring, but there is a beta-catenin H36R. And so we express that in Drosophila eye epithelium, and it, we, get, we end up with ectopic tumors. So, and a higher expression of beta-catenin. So beyond beta-catenin, this is very interesting because beta-tercept has a number of other substrates that bind at this, with, through this motif of an SXXHS. So we're going on and testing those. Okay, so now here's the second story I wanted to tell before I get to neurodegeneration. And it's, it's a new idea, and it actually relates maybe somewhat to the first talk you heard. And that's about somatic mutations and, and um, what they might mean. Do they confer dynamic function? We know that somatic mutations are random, but somehow some recur over and over again. So one thing we ask is, hmm, might the higher pH of a cancer cell confer some evolutionary force? for the retention of somatic mutations. It's something we're probably never going to be able to answer conclusively, but we started to test some ideas. And we started to test ideas based on a very, very simple idea, and that is, what about arginine to histidine? So this would be an example of possibly a gain in pH sensing. So arginines have a, a pKa of 13 or more, completely never changes. pKa of arginine never changes. So it's always going to be protonated, regardless of what the pH is. Now, a histidine might be protonated in a normal cell with a somewhat lower pH, and it might be neutral in a cancer cell with a higher pH. And the, one of the first things we found is that arginine to histidine are in mutations are enriched in cancers. And this has since been published by two other, paper, two other groups. So compared to 1,000 genomes, and this is completely independent of codon bias or CPG site frequency, um, arginine to histidines in cancer are highly overexpressed, suggesting some evolutionary force. I don't know if it's pH. It could be a lot of different things. So we decided to test two candidates. One is the EGF receptor that has a recurrent arginine to histidine mutation. So, whoops, to understand this, some of you may know, but just for review, receptor tyrosine kinases share this conserved structural motif where there's something off the kinase domain called a C helix. And when that C helix is swung out, the kinase is inactive. And when it's swung in, the kinase is active. And the swung out is shown, whoops, is shown in green here, and it's swung in is shown in cyan. Now what the wild type arginine does is it forms this electrostatic hydrogen bonding with um, the C helix that keeps it in a swung out or inactive conformation. So we said, well, what happens when that's mutated to a histidine? And could the protonation state of the histidine make any difference? And so with Matt Jacobson, we did molecular dynamics to show that, and now this is measuring the angle of the C helix to the center of the molecule. And when that histidine is protonated, it adopts a very similar con conformation as the natural or the wild type arginine. However, when it's neutral, it's got a more swung in position. And so we went on to confirm a gain in pH sensing by the mutant with increased kinase activity at a higher pH. We did that with recombinant EGF receptor, showing both autophosphorylation is higher at a higher pH, as well as substrate phosphorylation. But the wild type receptor is pH insensitive. We showed it also in cells by expressing EGFR again, but this is specific to the histidine mutation. There's another recurring mutation, an R to G, that's pH insensitive. And finally, we could take it down to a functional behavior by showing transformation. 
that is pH sensing sensitive with the uh, mutant receptor, but not with wild type. And as a comparison, we use transformation with BRAF, which is also pH sensitive. Okay, one other candidate before I move on to um, neurodegeneration is sort of the big daddy of them all, P53, ARG273H. This is one of two of very, very highly recurring, the most highly recurring mutations in, in P53. There's probably over a thousand papers just on this mutation. There's a crystal structure. No one's ever mentioned anything about possible change in pH sensing. So what does wild type P53 do? That, do it? Well, it functions as a tumor suppressor because it binds to DNA and it binds to an electrostatic interaction. A, po a positively charged arginine binds a negatively charged phosphate backbone of DNA. And this would be markedly decreased if it had a histidine that was deprotonated. And so we went on to show that, that there is uh, a gain in pH sensing, this time decreased DNA binding at the lower pH. Uh, and that's shown here in vitro, as well as luciferase assays. And I won't go through all the data, but also PCR and arrays show this, that the mutant has markedly different transcript abundance uh, at two pHs, but not the wild type. So I'm going to skip over this. We've shown PCA analysis. What we're very interested in is not the mutation at the gene level, but at the protein level. And what we're finding is that a lot of mutations involve a change in protein charge. And this really has not been talked about, but I think it's going to be possibly relevant to mutations we see in Alzheimer's, in which there are a lot of mutations that involve a change in um, charge of the protein. So we started a new direction a little over a year ago. And it's, um, the, the award is to four labs at UCSF. Amy Cow and I, Amy is a neurologist and also a, a C. elegans biologist, are studying roles for cytosolic pH as well as lysosomal pH. And here's just an example. So it's been reported that in neurodegenerative diseases, there's a lower cytosolic pH. And some people shrug it off and say, oh, it's just a consequence of dying cells. So what we did is we treated mammalian cells with uh, brafeldin A to induce an unfolded protein response. And we get a decrease in pH, just shown here. But then we showed that this is independent of dying cells because we use cells that are null for backs and backs. So autophagy is inhibited and we still get a decrease in pH. The other two people on the, on the award are Matt Jacobson, who's a computational biologist. We've done molecular dynamics simulations with him for years, and Torsten Whitman, who works on microtubule dynamics, and his lab and my lab actually share a large complex, and we're looking at pH-dependent tau behaviors, microtubule binding, and stability, and that's what I want to just spend a few minutes talking about. So we thought, maybe naively, because we weren't thinking about protein chemistry, is that a decrease in pH might cause microtubules, to, um, might cause tau to fall off microtubules. That's not what we see at all. We see that an increase in pH completely disrupts tau microtubule binding. Okay, and I'm going to show you with this movie. We can increase pH a number of different ways. I you know, won't go into the details now, but take a look on the left. And what this is, is this is emerald tau. So this is tau tagged with a, a green fluorescent protein. So what you're looking at not really is microtubules, but you're looking at tau that's decorating microtubules. We start out at a neutral pH, raise it, and then go right back to a neutral pH. And I think, nope, I'm going to have to do it from here. And how do I do it? I can't find it. Help me. <laughs> uh, I can't find the cursor. 
Oh, there it is. Come on, come on, come on. Here it goes. Ready? You're going to see it. It's on, it's off, and it goes right back on. And then if we look at a GF cells expressing a GFP tubulin, we really don't see any profound effects. I mean, the microtubules aren't disassembling. So it really looks like tau is falling off. We call this sort of as a pun to tau 4R, that this is a 4R response, as shown here, robust, rapid, reversible, and reproducible. So we can quantify this. Um, it's very, very rapid. So if we measure just cytosolic fluorescence, emerald tau falling off of microtubules, it's very rapid on, very rapid off no effect on tubulin, and then we can score this and quanti quantify it for multiple cells. Um, and we can show it in vitro, that it's pH dependent, that at a higher pH, less tau is binding. So what's the mechanism? Well, lo and behold, even though it is not talked about, in each tau repeat, and even in R4 that's not shown here, there is an invariant histidine. Now, we should have, you know, thought about this before, but tau binds to microtubules through an electrostatic interaction. Posit it's very positively charged. Microtubules are very negatively charged. So we thought, oh, maybe these histidines are titrating. When we increase pH, they're neutral, and tau is going to fall off microtubules because you're decreasing the electrostatic interaction. I don't think that's happening. We don't know what's happening, but we know that that histidine is critical for binding because when we mutate it to a lysine, which is always going to be protonated, it doesn't bind at all. And we really don't, you know, we're sort of scratching our heads um, and trying to figure out what this is. But it's clearly, um, uh, it's, it's new, and it's going to be a new mechanism that we need, need to work out. So this kind of links it to cancer, because we know that one of the ways we can increase pH is to express an oncogene. So what happens when we have cells e expressing tau as well as an oncogene? And you'll see this. Tau is very cytosolic. We use nigerisin, which is a protonophore, to neutralize pH and bring it down to 7,2. And you'll see, if it would play, that tau is going to completely go back onto microtubules immediately. Um, I'm going to skip for this. We're starting to do this um, with endogenous tau and using IPS-derived neurons, as shown here. Uh, we've stained these for microtubules in pink and for actin in green, and we can show that tau comes on expression with differentiation. And this is my last slide, and this is a new direction we're very excited about, and it's on how can we really measure lysosomal pH, which we can't do right now with current tools. So there are a couple of dyes, lysotracker, lysosensor, that are taken up by um, endocytosis, but they end up in endosomes and autophagosomes, so they're just not applicable for any kind of a screen or for really look at lysosomal pH. So Brad Webb in our lab, who's developed several other biosensors, took LAMP1, which is only in lysosomes, fused it to, uh, at the cytosol uh, face with mCherry to, as a sort of ratio metric, and then at the luminal face with an MT sapphire, which is a GFP variant with a very low pKa. And we can show that this accurately measures pH between a range of about 4.5 up to about 6. And that's shown here. It localizes only in lysosomes, and it's responding to an increase in pH. And that's can show, shown here at even greater um, uh, magnification. So why are we excited about this? This is what we want to do with it. First of all, we want to accurately measure lysosomal pH with neurodegeneration. It really hasn't been done. Second of all, it's going to be a terrific screening tool. 
we really, to this date, beyond the VATPase, we don't know what regulates lysosomal pH. There may be this chloride channel, and it could be a calcium proton exchanger, but we really don't know. So based on lysosomal proteomics, we're going to use it to, with a CRISPR screen of lysosome membrane proteins. And then finally, we're really excited, is you saw how the lysosome pH increased. Can we block that? So if we use a neurodegenerative cue and the lysosome pH increases, can we block that with some chemical compound? So we'll be screening a chemical compound library. So that's it. Um, I've shown you that increased pH in cancers enables a number of behaviors through multiple mechanisms and through multiple pH sensors. We're just beginning to apply some of these principles to neurodegeneration and what this might mean in terms of changes in protein electrostatics. And our funding uh, on pH in cancer is an NCI grant. And our funding on Alzheimer's pathologies is through the Paul Allen Family Foundation. Sorry I went over. Good thing I was last. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Jonathan. I have very hard hearing, but with beta TRCP, you said there's a um, there's a uh, lysine um, in the beta propeller close to where that binds. Have you tried changing that to see if you order the specificity? We haven't beta mutated TRCP? that one. That's yeah, what, is that what that you mean? Would be a cute thing for a you mean like target that that charge lysine? compensation type switch. It's obvious that's a that's something we should do. I, I was intrigued by the um, I think the the cancer genome analysis versus the thousand genomes analysis for the origin to history and the cosmic yeah actually we didn't use that's that one we started with cosmic but then we went to alexandrov we've been using alexandrov i'm just wondering is is if you eliminate p53 from that cancer database it's not the signal it's not there? due to recurrence that's taken into so that was done by ryan hernandez at ucsf and we don't we don't take we don't consider recurrence as part of that What's interesting, and I, I skipped over the PCA analysis, but there are some groups of cancers that are very high arch to his and those cancers are very low E to K. And then there are three cancers, bladder, cervix, and melanoma, that are very high E to K, and it's not just because of the UV site, that are very, very low arch to his We don't know what that means, but I think it's telling us something about the cancers. And this is more of a general question. Since all of these are diseases of age, does the pH of a cell increase as it ages, and could this be the cause? So what does Dan Gotchling say? I think he says yes, but, or it's a change with the AT, VATPase. So there's a, 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 someone named Dan Gotchling who used to be at the Hutch, and he's now at um, Calico, who's done this with yeast, and, and he does think that pH dynamics and dysregulated pH is a disease of aging. I think he thinks it goes up, and we were thinking it goes down. I, you know, I'm not sure. We haven't looked. But there is, and then there's also someone, I think his name is Keith Nurkey at Rochester, who's been looking at it in C. elegans pH. And Dan's looking at it in yeast, right? Yeah, and a, and a less acidic lysosome is going to decrease cathepsin activity, and that's going to cause a decrease in protein degradation, which is possibly leading to aggregation. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.